Okay, well, good morning, um, everyone, and, and welcome um, to the second of, of three webinars in this series brought to you by Hawksford uh, in conjunction with us here at the China Britain Business Council. I'd just like to remind everyone um, that the next webinar is on the 8th of October um, and will cover um, Hawksford five, Hawksford's five steps to successful integration of your business in China. Uh, to quickly introduce the China Britain Business Council, um, we help British and Chinese businesses and organisations work together in China, the UK and third markets around the world. Um, and with 65 years of experience and experts in 11 UK offices and 15 lo Chinese locations, um, we support companies of all sizes and sectors, whether they are new entrants um, or established operations to realise the full potential of the fastest growing market in the world. Um, our unrivaled network of 130 uh, staff across 26 locations in the UK and China uh, understands the sectorial, geographic and cultural aspects of business success in China. Uh, and this personal expertise is complemented by a range of CBBC events, research and consultative services tailored to meet the specific requirements of companies. We also leverage the knowledge of our members, uh, such as Hawksford, to ensure that our clients can access the best advice and services, whatever stage of market entry they are at. Our diverse 1,000 strong membership includes some of the UK's largest and most established companies, some of the UK's most dynamic and innovative SMEs, as well as leading Chinese companies. We cooperate uh, with the Department of International Trade, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and across government to highlight the export opportunities for UK companies and investment opportunities for Chinese organisations. Uh, as an independent organisation, CBBC offers trusted, impartial advice while maintaining close partnerships with the UK and Chinese companies, the Chinese governments. Uh, it's really been a great pleasure to introduce this webinar, and CBBC has been doing a great deal of work with Hawksford over the past year. Uh, today, uh, Fabio will be giving us a rundown of the five essential tips for UK companies doing business in China, exploring issues such as cultural challenges the need for market intelligence, the importance of an online strategy for China, and the importance of selecting the right team for your China strategy. Um, without further ado, I'll hand over to, to Fabio. Good morning to those in the UK and European time zones, and good often, afternoon or evening to our Asian colleagues closer to us. This is Fabio Stella speaking, China Head of Sales and BD for Oxford, today hosting our second webinar on five essential tips for foreign companies doing business in China with a special focus on UK business. In our first slide, what you basically can see is a look at our presence and practice in Asia. Few numbers for you not to basically annoy you with, with the details. Oxford holds eight offices in APAC, more than 200 professionals, most of whom based in Greater China, out of our six offices here namely Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Suzhou, Shanghai, and Beijing. We offer a range of services from corporate filings and incorporation to immigration, HR, payroll, and of course, our bread and butter provision made of tax and accounting. We basically have an history of 10 years of expertise in tax compliance, bookkeeping, personal tax, and VAT management, and we were recently recognized as grade A taxpayer by the Shanghai Local um, Tax Bureau. Over here, you can basically see what I hope to embody as a wide experience, both geographically, as I've been based both in the eastern part of China, namely Shanghai, but also in what is now called the Greater Bay Area, with Guangzhou and Shenzhen offices um, open during 2014 and 2016. But you can also see that my previous expertise uh, spaces from different sectors and topics which are relevant for the Chinese market. Most importantly, you can find my contact details over there. Anyway, in case you don't remember, it's name.surname at oxford.com, just like any of our professionals over here. Let's go right into the intro. I'm not going to bother you with the details, but we'll just check uh, the title of each, of each topic. Uh, we start with a brief introduction in order to verify how China is actually shaped and influenced by the local regulations being a state market economy, we will then pass to the cultural divide that Chris has also underlined in showcasing CBBC experience in all the regional offices. We will then shift to the market intelligence that you guys have to deliver before addressing your China market entry plan. 
in order then to pass to what is one of the main and uh, biggest topics on, on our table at the moment, that is to say the online strategy for companies accessing the Chinese market. In the end, we will see how China cultural details and also the online strategy will need you to put your team in shape and not simply delocalizing what is what is working or has worked in the past in other jurisdictions right here in this in this uh, huge market. So without further ado, let's move into the intro. Of course, China is taking over the global economy and impacting on the Western world like never before. Uh, if we look at data, China is nowadays the largest country in the world by population and the second largest economy in the world. Many UK businesses are attracted by the size and the increasing spending power of the consumer market over here. Uh, the data tell us that 5.6 trillion is the forecasted figure for retail sales and China is of course expected to take over the US in the long run and become the largest retail market in 2019. However, China acts as a single country in news outlets uh, globally, but historically you need a lot to dig in in order to understand what are the details of each regional zone and this second webinar, which is a little bit more strategical than the first one, which was focusing on the details for incorporating foreign invested vehicles in China, would like to offer you some insights, starting from one of the, let's say, regional uh, places of business, just like Hong Kong, which might be more renowned to, to UK businesses. You can check the difference between the 1993, when Hong Kong economy represented 25% of Greater China's one, whereas today such a huge and thriving place of business like Hong Kong, no matter recent uh, scrambles, only occupies 3% of the total output of, of China as a country. Of course, our first point is related to the ease of doing business, which although acting on a mostly bureaucratical jurisdiction, is still taking place over there. Don't, don't really ask us what is happening in terms of regulations and updates, but ask yourself why this is happening. We can see from the chart over here, indicating the position that China has held in the tradingeconomies.com um, index uh, pulled out by the World Bank. Basically, we can see that as of 2018, China was ranked uh, 46 uh, in terms of uh, index for ease of doing business with a tremendous improvement from the previous year, 78th position. Uh, and of course here, challenges are still, are still uh, tackling foreign businesses. And as you can see in 30, 31st percent of 338 respondents from a recent survey have actually indicated bureaucracy as one of the main hurdles when doing business in China. Mostly related to licenses and, permit, and permits to be obtained before starting your business, but also labor, laborious procedures, no matter when you face banks or one of the local authorities. Considering that China is still a huge market, the authorities here have been focused on keeping the opportunities uh, away from the table of foreign investors and only opening them up once the local economy was actually able to face competition from abroad. We can see from this other slide, how reform has always empowered the government here in China to become a governing stick over the hurdles that the economy was facing uh, in several years. What we want to deliver is a message that gives you the opportunity to, to analyze the main changes in terms of regulations, uh, tax breaks, and so on during the um, period from 2018 to 2019, in order to also understand what challenges of the futures China was actually trying to, to face um, in these very years. We can see that everybody has heard, at least um, from the message delivered by President Trump during the, the heart of the, of the trade war about the foreign investment law. That was basically the output needed uh, after G2G lobbying here in China by chambers of commerce among which CBBC is definitely an example, but also the European Chambers of Commerce here in China. Of course, 
foreign investors are still battling for a greater FDI access and unequal treatment when compared to China state-owned enterprises or local businesses in general. On the other side, you might also have heard that the fact that from January 2019, we have a reviewed individual income tax reform, which was actually trying to release more spending power in the bargaining middle class and in the lowest classes in order to tackle what was uh, foreseen as a car and property sales deadlock. Of course, this measure was also targeting what the economists call uh, the middle income trap whenever countries like China developing from, um, from a, um, an economy in, an, in its initial state have to bring out of poverty the biggest amount of, of uh, consumers and, and of inhabitants. This is something that is still ongoing. As you might know, uh, China has just passed the 50-50 threshold between inhabitants of big cities and inhabitants of uh, countryside. So then we pass to what has been a hurdle on the other side for us as tax agents and, and accountants. Um, basically the fact that in less than two years, VAT rates, no matter for goods traded here in China or services resold over, over here, have basically changed three times and are now lowered for goods from what was 17% to 16% last year and now 13%, uh, but also services which have changed free rates in, in, in such a short terms. Of course, this was addressing most, most of the worries by exporters and importers in this big market, but was also trying to support local demand right when China is trying to pass from a manufacturing country into um, uh, consumer goods one. Of course, the last point is related to corporate income tax cuts. You might have heard of other jurisdictions or places of business where to structure your investment in Asia Pacific, just like Singapore and Hong Kong. Those two have actually almost the same corporate income tax rate. And of course, it's not, it's not by chance. Uh, whereas China has a, has a set 25%, which is actually then slashed by a lot of incentives which actually turn that rate into effectively very close to the one of Singapore and Hong Kong. And that, of course, was trying to address the fact that because of the cost of doing business and the difficulties uh, companies face over here, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, not only locals, but al also uh, the first investors uh, in the 80s and the 90s, like the Taiwanese and the, and, and the Hong Kongese businessmen, we're already trying to decouple. That's the new term, term that, we, that we hear whenever talking about factories that move from South China to Vietnam or other Southeast Asia uh, jurisdictions. The second topic on our table is to tackle the cultural divide. Um, basically, you might, you might understand that in such a huge country, and similarly, for example, to, Asia, uh, to, to, to India in Asia, culture matters over here more than in other places. China is a very old country, yes, but this brave new China is only 70 years old, as you, we will see in the celebration upcoming on October the 1st. So let's dive deep into, into this topic. Today's China is basically made of four huge city clusters, as you might see by peeping on, on, our, on our map. Those clusters are represented in the north by the Beijing area, together with Tianjin and the upcoming new city of Xionhan, which has been named uh, the, the Shenzhen of the future. And then we move directly to the southwestern part where Chengdu and Chongqing, Chongqing being the largest city in terms of population here in China with more than 33 million people, then passing down south where actually the Per River Delta represented by Guangzhou and Shenzhen as uh, city tigers over there, is now being reshaped into the Greater Bay Area of the future, including also the two special administrative region down south, uh, being Hong Kong and, and Macau. Of course, by only analyzing those, those cluster, one might miss what is basically key to our today's seminar because we are, we are broadcasting out of Shanghai. And with Shanghai, you get the fourth and last area, which is the Yangtze River Delta, composed not only by Shanghai municipal area, but also provinces like Zhejiang and Jiangsu being among China's most uh, wealthy. 
We can see that about 170 cities have more than 1 million residents. Just think about that in terms of comparison, for example, with the UK. And major cities like the ones heading the cluster that we analyzed in these slides, namely Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen, always have a gross domestic product and population that is so big to basically operate and represent a whole country. Each cluster can be then seen as one regional productive district if we analyze it uh, down the line. If we look at AT Kearney Global Cities Index, the number of big cities in China that have jumped from uh, seven in 28 to 27 nowadays, we see that whatever I mentioned before related to the divide between countryside and, and city, the city base over here, is always updating and will probably not end in, in the next 20 years. Uh, we are not including Hong Kong, together with Macau being those special administrative regions, but we think that the fact that those two have still their own currency and a separated legal system might also represent how China would look like in the future or what different challenges they will try to address. Any company that is planning to enter this market will have to consider the fact that the place of business is made of unique characteristics and decision should not only be based on which city looks better on the map in terms of communication of logistics um, inter exchanges but also the industry if it's well represented over there or if it's somehow a unicorn um, because this will matter in terms of finding suppliers and services providers of course if you're trading in goods and if you're manufacturing proximity to China's biggest deep water ports might be a factor, but please take note that among, uh, among the world's biggest ports, a lot of them are based in China's coastal area, where represented by all the clusters that we analyzed. Of course, if we had to look at a division, we would basically assign shipping or whatever related to parcels, especially uh, when tackling China's cross-border e-commerce sectors in the Greater Bay Area, where Shenzhen is basically, together with Guangzhou, one of the main uh, hubspots for, for parcel deliveries uh, on both sides of the world. For financial services, I would say that Shanghai and Shenzhen look like the best options you have on the table. Whereas if your business is strictly related to regulatory output and public policy, you might have no choice other than structuring in the North, especially in Beijing. So, we pass now to the third topic on the table, which was already introduced by the last slide. That is to say, before stepping your foot onto China, you need to deliver to your own organization and to yourself some basic market intelligence. We stress this with our clients and we will stress this with you. Do your own research and build on that because competition and your strategy against that is key to define success or failure for your investment over here. We just want to deliver to you the message which is represented and embodied by Amazon Case and their investment into China. We know that this market had different buying habits, for example, from the States, which is the jurisdiction where Amazon has thrived in the past years. It is estimated that 37% of the products that actually could succeed in the US would, would instead fail in China. So this tells you a lot about all those small vendors that, are, that were trying to develop their, their Amazon strategy. After 10 years of business over here, where it occupied a very, very sh small um, market, market share, uh, if compared to the whole, Amazon recently uh, recognized the fact that probably a merger with one of China's biggest cross-border e-commerce uh, players, uh, namely Kaola from NetEase Group, would have been best for its success over here. Recognizing your loss is sometimes victory itself, as the Uber and Didi Chushin case uh, showed in the past. What happened is that basically Amazon sold its own shares uh, to, to Kaola Netis and is now basically pitching on the, on the success of that platform that was then acquired by Alibaba Group, of course, which is showcased among the, the two images over here. What happened is that by trying to bet on the main 
the main giant in, in China internet market, Amazon simply decided to pull back in order to avoid future losses or even to simply avoid um, basically um, a failure for the, for the Chinese market, which is so important also in terms of uh, PR. Amazon over here had two variable interest structures because of market access walls. And we've already received some questions related to internet brands and solution providers. And now they can, they can basically go around what is so-called the, the Great Wall over here. Well, for Amazon trying the shortcut in order to still access a market that is regulated for foreign e-commerce platforms, uh, namely, you cannot get an internet content provider license, which is only available to locally invested enterprises. Well, that has failed in the end, even though Amazon found its way around this regulation. Apart from these two big names in the internet market, we can go to something more related to FMB, and namely the Lacking Coffee case. What we want to deliver over here is the message that no market niche and the one that Starbucks was occupying in China was actually uh, a niche for a few years. And no matter how hard the market is, here in China will remain without competitors. So what we see is the fact that no matter if, of course, Starbucks remains the most successful coffee retailer over here, Luckin simply studied what were the pitfalls and the uh, Achilles heels issues of, of Starbucks business model and it identified the need for convenience and affordability, which are still the main worries in the Chinese consumers, in order to then find what is basically a debt financed uh, market growth that could actually base on that could actually be based on the on the revenues instead than than, than profit. You might know that uh, Luckin is aiming at, at 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 IPO. And that will be the main the main competition model, no matter no matter what future it holds for these two uh, competitors in the Chinese market. A third case on how to leverage on local competition is probably the best case scenario for what can happen to foreign invested enterprises in China. We're talking about what happened in the case between Coca-Cola versus Wahaha mostly because China is always seen as a market made of copycats, but that was probably China of 20 and 30 years ago, if it ever was. What happens is that in that case, we could say that it was the foreign invested enterprise sneaking in a market sector, which was made of um, beverages that were mixing up uh, milk-based drinks together with fruit juice, and actually turn it into an even more successful uh, product by leveraging on the strength of the other uh, dedicated sector of the brand itself. You know, the Coca-Cola group is a very big uh, enterprise with different strengths, especially here was namely known for Minute Maid, the section of orange juice and, and other fresh fruits. Um, and what happened is that the product branded Coca-Cola turned out to be more successful, not only in the local market, but also as an export tool to other economies in Southeast Asia, namely Malaysia and Indonesia. Despite local competition, we still have nowadays traces of foreign companies that continue to thrive in the Chinese market, and they are not afraid to innovate only because of intellectual property rights issues. What happens, of course, to those investments is that they access a green channel of priority and of tax benefits uh, laid out by the local authorities who are always keen to favor R&D and innovative investment. What we've basically faced in the last months is the fact that for Shanghai, but also other um, cities, authorities, the Tesla case and the Giga factory that was open in southern Pudong uh, is basically the milestones that each and every project brought up by large corporates should reach. And if you think about that, Tesla didn't have to invest a single penny in China because it was the government itself to find funding from local banks and um, state-owned en enterprises in order to land a project like that, which is super important for the EV vehicles sector over, over here in China. Without talking too much about local competition, unless the question and, ans and answer section will, will deliver more on that, 
we will go directly on what is probably the most interesting topic of today's uh, seminar that is to say um, how growth is basically traveling online these days physical marketing and physical uh, business development leaves china's potential basically untapped why we are saying this because we believe that online presence is key for plans of, of success in china's burgeoning middle class as we put out over here online strategy is a must and if we look at data brought up by uh, consumer research firm ipsos Chinese affluent consumers are twice as likely to download applications or content pulled out of WeChat mini programs uh, offered by luxury brands here compared to the same category of consumers in non-Chinese um, in non-Chinese classes. What happened is basically that the younger uh, generation is constantly online and is using messaging, short videos, broadcasting, live streaming, and social media for whatever regards their working hours and their time off. It basically embodies also their, buy, their, their buying journey. And if your brand or your solution is not tapping on, the, on those markets, you're basically unseen and unspotted in, in the lives of Chinese uh, young consumers. Those consumers are also the ones that are able to spend more if compared to how much they bring home at the end of the month from their jobs. Uh, because they believe in market experiences more than simply buying brands and, and products. So this is the basically what you can call the untapped potential of what everybody calls the X generation over here. So provided that online strategy should not be put at doubt, the real question would then be, what are the best stages to showcase your presence and what are the channels on which you should basically invest? And we try to tell you more with this slide. Businesses that look to engage with Chinese consumers should realize that because of the Great Wall activated over here by the Chinese authorities, the channels are completely different from what one would use back in Europe or in the Western world. We have local platforms such, such as Weibo, WeChat and Baidu. And if you ask me for a comparison of those, Baidu is basically the local Google, being Google unaccessible after it, it, its exit uh, with servers brought, brought out of, of Peking University in the 2000s. Weibo is instead a mixture between FMB, uh, like Facebook and Twitter, because it limits the characters that you can actually um, write over there. And now, has in place some strong regulation against key opinion leader, the so-called KOLs, whenever they try to tag um, companies or corporate accounts, because it asks them to pay a fee, which is of course always reimbursed by by those uh, by the very same corporate. On the other side, if you're looking at, a, at an alternative uh, to Instagram, which is also blocked here, you might think about one of the new platforms which mixes up cross-border e-commerce, e-commerce, and live streaming, namely Shaonshu or My Little Red Book. Um, on Instagram especially, we have to mention one case that happened to us recently, a client that was trying to access in the Chinese market and test it with, with basically online e-commerce. We realized that their investment in traditional marketing and offline initiatives equals zero so they have no investment in traditional pr they only deliver their brand message via instagram thanks to the support of uh, superstars and kols back in the us well what happened is that their sales revenue for the first two weeks of online only strategy without having any flagship store or any presence offline in china's golden miles for retail was to deliver nine million of sales revenue and of course, now they're able to plan on their offline strategy thanks to that portfolio of revenues. So if you look at the, at the chart that we, that we highlighted over here, you can see that for traditional search engine market share, you have no alternative to Baidu if your brand is usually positioned on those channels back at home. Well, that's the choice that you have to make. Of course, Baidu is similar to Google, but very different in terms of competition over there and listing 
at least in the first 10 results that come out in the first page. So make sure that your budget, although targeting this, this channel, is on different levels because you will need much more in order to, to appear in those, in those 10 results. Of course, this brings us to the other slide, which is when you build your product or service entry strategy for China, why not building it up around your customer or user base, thanks to the means brought up by marketing uh, nowadays. E-commerce empowers your company to both test the market, as we mentioned in the, in the real case scenario that we, that we disclosed to you, but also have lower fixed cost because an online platform wouldn't ask for the same amount of money that a offline landlord of a shop would. And of course, it gives you the, the chance to gather an incredible mine of data on customers' behavior, with this impacting what company you should actually be here. We can see the growth rate, which is always descending, if compared to the percentage of total retail sales between online and offline in China. If you're targeting a consumer, a consumer market, of course, retail e-commerce shouldn't be off your radar. What happens is that retail e-commerce sales in 2019 will grow much faster than total retail in general. And the increase will be of 27% year, year on year. By 2023, local retail e-commerce sales will represent 64% of total retail sales. So this embody weapons basically for, for your structure you should try to identify new management methods and reporting lines for a customer-centric model. Everybody talks to us about a chief financial officer for China, a country ad, a CEO, or regional structuring that doesn't include marketing or the, the figure of chief marketing officer, which would be better placed over here. You should also try to spur into integration between product-based R&D and supply chains. Think about the effect of uh, showcasing, for example, made to measure in companies like Gucci or, or other fashion brands, uh, which proved to be successful in directly in retail stores over here in China. That would also give us the opportunity to reinvent your marketing as basically a, cons a consumer management model for new retail, which should never ignore either offline or online, but try to leverage on both in order to turn into a higher level of success. The plan would be to revolutionize the route to market and the retail formats uh, that you're using in all the other jurisdictions in order to, br to bring a fresh strategy for the China consumer over here. Of course, your structure should be basically digitalized because that's what e-commerce and the retail sector hacks for brands over here in China. And investment in new technology in order to replace the old kind of investment here in China, which was labor-based, shouldn't be a doubt. So whenever there are platforms that are cutting costs in the long run but require a high investment in day one for the licensing, you should always consider them as good tools to forecast uh, your growth and cut costs in the long term. We are now at the last point, and of course you might have already noticed that we are trying to go deeper in what is what is the field of management consultancy, a little bit off-road for what is our main uh, bread and butter services, but this is important, I believe, as a message to be delivered to, um, to you guys. So, as a foreign consultant for foreign invested, uh, in, invested enterprises over here in China, I could simply tell you that the best strategy is to focus on similar talents. Uh, whenever I, I, I talk to clients, reality would actually have already gotten me wrong, as branding issues and translation examples show you in these very slides. So we know for a fact that given the presence of Mandarin and um, simplified characters over here in China, literal translation doesn't really mean localization in full. Localizing content, of course, goes beyond translation by either software or uh, experts on Chinese language. And language idiosyncrasies uh, mean that the same word might be interpreted differently uh, given cross-cultural uh, interpretation. 
the example over here is related to Nintendo, the Japanese game maker, that tried to pull out one of its most famous characters over here that was uh, Pikachu out of Pokemon. So you can see that the difference between Beka Jiao and the Mandarin Pikachu uh, made Hong Kong people furious because the name that was previously showing some support for Cantonese culture uh, became then uh, translated into, into Mandarin, uh, leaving the consumer unaware of what plans uh, Nintendo had for, for, its, for its market. McDonald actually followed a similar path because the consultants invited to discuss on how the brand should have called itself in the Chinese market, chose a transliteration that was actually more similar to the Canton uh, Cantonese version, version of it, um, the Chinese name being Mai Dan Lao. And you might not be aware of this, but Mai Dan Lao sounds very similar to McDonald's. What McDonald tried to do in the last few months was to rebrand into Golden Arches, so basically recalling the shape of their uh, very significant logo. Well, the result is that that rebranding campaign was not successful because we still call Mai Dan Lao as it is over here in China. So sorry for McDonald, but uh, they faced challenges at the very beginning and they are still facing challenges over here. So the heritage that the brand will bring on is really defined by the first uh, entrance in the market. Passing to another case, we can see how localization should basically brought up, be brought up by a local team. And we've seen that other retailers, one example is uh, French chain uh, Decathlon for sport products, had an incredible success with tents, but not really used for camping, but simply as uh, solar protection Against, uh, against the summer days over here in China. You can imagine that they even put solar filters to the garments that they use uh, to, to suit their tents. And that has represented a never before strategy because they don't have that product on the shelf in other European or Western locations. So if we focus on what I believe everybody is, uh, is aware of, uh, the DNG uh, PR failure, we can see that that was not uh, one and single mistake down the line here in China. And I believe that if we if we look at uh, what happened, uh, especially by checking the first picture where we can see um, an Asian beauty, she's not Chinese by the way, but she was used uh, in a campaign that was targeting uh, Beijing street cultures, but of course uh, juxtaposing what was beauty with the uh, with the, with the scenes that somebody might see. Well, of course, the Chinese consumers and the Chinese uh, online surfers were actually um, very angry at, at what was show, uh, showcased as the, the company's uh, strategy for uh, one of the uh, their product outputs. And that was only the first case. And of course, it ended up this way because the photo shooting and also the, ca the campaign was run directly from Italy using the same terms that Dolce & Gabbana would have used, for example, for the Italian market. Um, in China, you need particular attention. And in this case, we can see that they basically repeated another mistake without having local talents handling the um, PR campaign and the marketing strategy. Whenever they ended up discussing about the dining differences at the Chinese table and the Italian table, especially targeting cannoli and their dimension. So you might, you might find it very, um, very shocking, but we can all see that what happened to DNG, Versace, Burberry, and also Fendi recently on um, the differentiation of the Chinese places of business versus the actual jurisdiction, namely Hong Kong and China, without marking them as a greater China uh, territory, actually could happen to any single brand. The difference is that whenever you have decisional heads that are actually in touch with Chinese culture and can deliver to you an alert whenever your message is actually hitting against the pride and um, the sensibility of a country that is coming up uh, among, uh, among the world's biggest economy, uh, you always face a risk that can actually mark the end of your, of your investment here. This is to deliver that we believe there are no shortcuts in China. Registering and setting up 
a foreign invested enterprise over here is of course a lengthy process and you always have shortcuts that are offered to you by any other um, service provider or uh, partner for the market. You might decide to do business without having a license, uh, but we can assure, assure you that risking your whole future over here is not a winning strategy, especially when you're representing a brand uh, that is not yours after all. Um, you cannot save on time and budget with those solutions, uh, but if that's the case, you might as well delay your access here and simply do it once and once for all, once for all with a successful strategy. So whenever looking at uh, providers and we put ourselves into those, you should always look for a high level of transparency and clear communication, no matter what's the subject at stake. Uh, customers and existing customers of those um, providers can always offer great examples on how their support has actually worked in the past with, with other cases. Yeah, right, so I'm done with today's webinar and I'm just waiting for questions from the audience on whatever is keeping uh, your investment off this jurisdiction or if you're already investment, invested in one of uh, China's foreign invested enterprises, what challenges are actually affecting your presence over here? Yeah, so if any, any attendees have any questions that they'd uh, like to ask, if they could just put them in the uh, the chat panel on the, the right-hand side of your screen, we'll, we'll get those questions answered. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so we got a question from Sarah Nicholson, and that targets that the main issue with starting out in China is that this company can't find an importer who will take on uh, their products. So the question would be, is there a good place to go where we can make these connections? And the sector is the publishing sector. And of course, uh, they already know that it's, it's quite a struggle. My suggestion over here would be, first of all, to make good use of uh, what are governmental agencies and also uh, private businesses that act uh, in relation to them. So for UK businesses, I'm actually referring to the Department for International Trade which has extensive uh, knowledge of what Chinese companies, not only here, but actually in all the jurisdictions where they act, um, can actually represent the important uh, and the licensing agent that, that you will need over here. Uh, we're talking about an industry which is quite sensible, just like the educational one, because content that is published on book needs to be um, basically uh, streamline into a censorship approval by the local authorities over here. So apart from the Department of International Trade, of course, the China-Britain Business Council is another example uh, to the extent that then you can decide whether to attend some of the fairs that, uh, of the fairs that these two uh, bodies uh, would, would suggest you uh, for China. And trade fairs here are actually on uh, the all year round. So that would be my, my answer. So during registration, we got a question that we would like to answer to, and that would be Matthew Cartwright. The question goes, the use and options with WeChat as a payment provider. So as I mentioned before, the question shouldn't really be whether to use one of these uh, channels. And of course, when we talk about uh, payment platforms, we're still talking about the two main giants. Uh, for the fintech sector over here in China, namely Tencent Group, which runs previously QQ and now WeChat mainly for payment, and Alibaba Group, which has created out of um, basically Alipay, uh, a way of processing payments on their platforms, no matter if they're related to cross-border e-commerce, namely Tmall Global, but also uh, Tmall for local e-commerce, so goods that are actually imported over here here and then uh, processed after custom clearance and retailed on, on those platforms. I believe WeChat also represents a way to target travel retail by Chinese uh, consumers that are reaching out uh, Europe and, and the UK. We see that most of uh, Europe's um, airports with connecting flights reaching out to China already have QR codes showcased among the payment, uh, the payment modes. And of course, that needs still to go together with Union Pay, which is basically the main circuit for all China's credit and debit cards. Um, of course, uh, MasterCard and Visa have a market foothold over here, 
but their market share is not is not satisfactory as they as as they wish. So of course we can we can go deeper in in details in a in a written answer to this, but WeChat should definitely remain on your on your radar if you're targeting Chinese consumers here or or abroad. I like challenges and I'll pick the last question for today, I guess, given the timing. Um, it is related to, I think, the main hurdle for the uh, Chinese market, and that is to say financial market. So we are a financial services firm, so we're looking to expand into China, and the control or foreign exchange is definitely an issue. And basically, uh, this would be I think uh, China's future, namely the financial sectors is one of those in which China is trying to uh, deliver extensive reform and market access um, openings. Uh, together with that, I would put also the automotive sectors uh, that Premier Li Keqiang has announced uh, to be basically uh, down the line for opening to uh, foreign invested enterprises without local partners. Uh, so if you think about Land Rover, Jaguar, but also uh, BMW and Volkswagen, uh, quoting uh, some of the German German groups active in that sector, um, are actually forced to have joint ventures. And that's the same for the financial services sectors whenever targeting, for example, banking and, and insurance. So, of course, opening will come definitely as long as China remains a state-run economy, uh, the control of the renminbi will still be in place. So you might have um, an opening to invest over here as a foreign invested enterprise as a whole, so without local partners, but the extent of what you can deliver in terms of financial services here will still be regulated by the State Administration for Foreign Exchange, in Chinese, Huawei Walijun, for our Mandarin-speaking friends, and that's not only an hurdle for firms in the financial services sector, but also to any kind of local or foreign invested enterprise that tries to receive funds or send funds overseas. So this is definitely a challenge. We can pick it up in details uh, in an email loop after the webinar. Um, I hope I answered at least part of, of the doubts that are keeping you away from here. All right, we make an exception and take the last question. Um, I read it as it is. We basically represent a, a luxury brand, and we are thinking if we should go for a Chinese name in order to disrupt uh, the local complete, uh, competition, or simply keep the English name in the market. So, of course, the question would be, how it's it's easier for us to, to build a brand image the moment that we access the local market. My suggestion would be based on the history of investments over here by uh, luxury brands from Europe, namely UK, France, and Italy. Um, if you have a heritage and a brand history, you should never waste that. So you should try whatever is possible in order to keep a dual mode of marketing um, whenever you're targeting the local market. So apart from your, of course, English name, I believe, you should definitely find a Chinese translation which can go down the line of messaging and discussions among China youth, but also the most traditional uh, middle class, which is all, also um, basically uh, spending a lot in, in, in China's uh, golden mines for, for retails. So having a content and a brand communication message that is um, easily um, accepted by the local audience will definitely serve your scope the moment that you decide to access and market your, your, your brand over here. All right, and I guess this marks the end of our journey together. If you like the, semi, the, the webinar, please keep in touch for the other one we will run on October the 8th at the same timing. And if you enjoy the content brought up by CBBC and Oxford, please uh, stay up for more because we always put out research, content, articles via our LinkedIn or Facebook pages.